Quite a lot of people who would like to ask various questions. If you can, make sure you are asking questions and not making speeches, please. Um, who would like to ask the first question? We can't all be shy. Ah, uh, gentleman well, in white in the middle. Uh, I'm not so much on questions, but one or two things that uh, Keith brought up. Um, which I know some answers to if you're interested. Uh, the communist countries going for religion. We, we had an Irish bloke in the Leicester Secular Society who gave a, a lecture on this some years ago about when they got their independence. And, uh, he was a union man. And he said that, uh, that everybody in, in Ireland, apart from the churches, was for, for independence, that was what they were fighting for, basically. And so when they did get their independence, the only one that was politically organised was the churches. And I suspect that's what you've got, the same syndrome in the communist countries, that they've got no political organisation outside of the church, and that's why the churches take over. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, and of course, I'm afraid we're seeing a little bit of that with the Arab Spring, or is it the Arab Winter? Um, and I'm, I'm, Terry was saying all the way through that, <coughs> yeah, I could see where this is going every time they say Al-Akbar, God is great or whatever, you know, that seems to be the only words they know. Uh, and, and, and you can see exactly that, that point. Although, given you mentioned Ireland, I have to say that um, there's an interesting twist on that. I mean, one of the, there's a reference made to the work I've been doing on can you see me? Are you happy with me sitting down? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, the, um, the, I've done a lot of work on, on, on child abuse, uh, clerical child abuse. Um, and one of those, uh, one of the, the, as you heard it, some of it's in the United Nations. And uh, the first time I did it there, it was uh, the church uh, rather inadvisably tried to, to issue a counter statement which of course was full of lies went all the way around the world and they were torn to bits for it the second time I did it they were wise and they didn't say anything the third time I was able to say I told you so because Jeffrey Robertson in his book uh, the case of the Pope which I do recommend to you um, he, he's a very uh, famous lawyer and he's uh, a QC and uh, has special status at the United Nations and he agreed with me, as I'd said before, that, that the church had broken in actually six articles of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child on which the, to which they're a voluntary signatory um, and on a wholesale scale. And the relevance of this is that I did a report about Ireland and child abuse uh, for the Council of Europe. And it's a 50-page report. And independently, Several people came to me uh, who I would have thought were fairly hard-boiled people and said that this report reduced them to tears. Uh, and it was about just how all this had happened uh, and how... Uh, and I even found reports going back to the 1960s that gave you a pretty good idea of what was happening and nothing happened. Why didn't it happen? Because of the absence of secularism, we had effectively the church and the state were super glued, as indeed they are in Russia, I believe. Uh, and it means that none of the checks and balances work, and in fact there's a deference by civil servants and the judiciary and police, etc. All the people, the Department of Education, all the people who should actually be looking after these things well, oh well, we can't touch it because it's the church, and that's why it went on so so long. So, sort of picking up your point in, in a couple of uh, areas there. Okay, there was a chap in blue, right? <coughs> um, you were talking about small communities where the only kind of body in the community that could, well, there was uh, organised enough to uh, hold school together as a church, and about dismantling them. Do you think, in any case? Um, Keeping, keeping the church in some, some sort of role involved in education would be a positive thing, rather than getting rid of it. Well, I think it's lost any kind of legitimacy when you see, if you look at the church attendance figures, 
Uh, I mean, we're primarily talking about Christianity and largely the Church of England. I mean, it's the, 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 I don't know whether you realise, it's generally realised, that wasn't sort of personalised to you, but I just if people realise that, that the scale of the reduction in church attendance and its projected uh, uh, <coughs> attendance, it is mind-blowing. And the figures I'm about to give you come from Christian <coughs> research. It's not somebody... Uh, and dreamt up on a fag packet on a Saturday night from the National Secular Society who has sort of had it in for the church. Although when you hear the figures, you might think that it were, and that it is that. Uh, the, just one random figure from the past, the mass attendance in Britain has halved in 20 years. Now when you think about the number of old people that were there at the beginning of that and the end of that period, to actually drop the total by a half is going something. And what's happening is that, the, that with every 10 years that passes, the average age of the population rises by five years. And projecting the current figures through to uh, 2050, which is a long way, but uh, the way it's done, I don't think it's very far off. Well, comes to the point where the here we are with a, a nation of 60, 000, 60 million people, that the number of churchgoers on a normal Sunday uh, in 2050 for the Anglican and Catholic churches combined is 200,000 people, absolutely with an average age of getting on for 70. I mean, it's just breathtaking, um, and if you put these figures on a graph of the proportion of the, uh, of the church-going population, which itself is declining very fast, as I've, as I've illustrated, that belong to the different denominations. What is astounding <coughs> is that the rate of decline in the Anglican and the Catholic churches is just precipitous. Whereas it isn't, you know, if we talk about this proportion, it isn't uh, it's what's going up with the people who are in the evangelical and the charismatic churches. So when you get to around about 2030 or 2035, the, the Anglican and the Catholic churches are no bigger than the uh, evangelical and the charismatic churches. And, and from then on, they're actually less. So the institutional implications of that are absolutely breathtaking. And, and Terry reckons... The, the reason that the church is getting so dug into education that keeps opening these academies <coughs> is that basically th th there's, there's going to be nothing else for it to do. There's no, I mean, nobody in the pews. Uh, and it, then when you also start to think about faith-based welfare, you start to think, who's going to do all of this? And, and it's, there's no comfortable answer to that. Um, so I don't know whether that's helpful to your... Yeah, thank you. Uh, not legitimate. Uh, Yes, Anthony. Um, taking into account those figures and uh, the fact that uh, the presence of the Church of England in state schools, I'm not thinking about church schools, but state schools where there is still, I believe, collective worship and compulsory religious education, I wonder how important you think it is to focus particularly on disestablishment. I mean, I know the church was disestablished in Wales in 1926, but I don't know to what effect, but, but in England, I mean, it seems to be in the news quite a lot now, and surely there would be quite a popular, some popular support for them, I think. And would that be a way of shifting, you know, certainly it would cut off the legitimacy for church presence in state schools? Well, well I, I, I must uh, say that I think that the, the church is... Uh, position in Parliament, and I spend, I think, more time than I'd like to in the House of Lords, uh, and just to see the raw power there and the way that they use uh, their, their position to their own self-interest is, is, uh, is uh, something that I don't think is generally realised, but it really is quite something. Um, and, uh, I mean, there was even a small example of that I thought that was very telling, uh, to two examples recently. Um, one was with the election when the Lib Dems had to come over to the government side and so effectively they had to cross the, the floor of the House uh, uh, of Lords uh, to the side where the bishops are on. They're on the government side at the front nearest the throne. 
and um, and so the, the issue came. Well, where were the where were the Lib Dems going to, to front bench spokesman of the Lib Dems going to be when the natural place was going to be was exactly where the bishops were sitting, um, and there was a real knuckle fight out of this. And then for a short time, the Lib Dems were sitting behind the bloody bishops. Um, and, and in the end, it was rearranged. They went up the other end of the chamber on the same side, and, and uh, the, 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 the conservative backbenchers went behind the bishops. But I mean, it, 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 and the, the only place where there's an arm seat, an, an arm on the on the seat, is in, is on the bishops' bench. You know, there's silly things like that, but you just see the power of it. And, and yes, of course, you're right. But it's not kind of thing you say. Well, would I like to do it? And you know, would it all come from there? I mean, the the, the reality of this, and I don't think many people have worked harder for this than we have, um, but I'm, I, I, I don't want to fill you with false hopes. Uh, the, the big issue that's never properly uh, discussed about Lord's Reform and the bishops that go with it uh, is how that's going to be done and what's driving it. And, the reality is that the only way that the bishops will go is if we get a hundred percent elected second chamber. And the reality, I'm afraid, is that the, the people who are really in control of House of Lords reform are, of course, the politicians in the House of Commons and the, with the government ministers. I mean, the ministers that are in the House of Lords, they are really just puppets. They don't decide anything, as I've discovered to my cost. They're told what to say, uh, and it's really uh, pretty pitiful from that perspective. And I accept that the quality of the debate is intellectually much better. Uh, so, what we really have for this round is, are the, is, is the House of Lords going to become fully elected? And the answer is no, the Commons won't let it be, because the reason that, that the often given for the Lords to defer to the Commons, as they do, as you know, under the Parliament Act, is because the, of the primacy of the House of Commons because it's elected. And the House of Commons are going to make damn sure that the Lords aren't because then it would become like that because that argument would fall. And so, and, and the collateral damage with that is that we don't get rid of the bishops. I mean, and yet, I mean, I've really pushed the constitutional unit on the, the UCL constitutional unit, which is regarded as the prime independent. Uh, debating organization on this issue uh, and none of them at a similar meeting to this and really pushed all the speakers hard and none of them is very significant not one of them would justify the bishop staying there nobody dared to do that yet the practice in practice they're going to stay i'm afraid for the next round um, and, and nobody regrets it more than i do um, and I've seen them do some terrible things, even change legislation to make it fall foul of the European Employment Directive, gay people in organised religion because they didn't like it. And Sentamu did it himself, and Sentamu is not, not just an archbishop, he's a lawyer and he's even been a judge. He knows perfectly well about all of these things and his attitude is, never mind, we can vote it in and bugger Europe. It's, basically what he thinks. Never mind our treaty ob ob uh, obligations to the EU. And they are vicious. They really are. And uh, they know I've got their number. <laughs> uh, Chris, you had your hand up before. Uh, at the beginning of the talk you said you have painted us the most hated man in Britain right now. Yes. That might be the case. I think the only person that beats you right now is probably Richard Dawkins, who's the media's <coughs> painting as some satanic Stalin reincarnate or something. Um, the media, I've been following everything that's been happening in the past sort of four, six weeks, and it seems to be the media seems to be overwhelmingly on one side and not really presenting our case at all in any way. Um, painting us as militant and tolerant and blah, blah, blah. 
do you think, in your opinion, that the media have been successful in giving us a bit of a PR problem? Secondly, do you think that might be a problem going forward? And thirdly, if so, what will we do about it? Well, uh, the guy who's sitting over in the corner over there, who's got square eyes because he spends, he gets up at six o'clock every morning to put up on the NSS website what the papers say, I think it would be impertinent of me not actually to, with your permission, to hand over the microphone to him to answer that question because nobody knows more about it than he does. And I, 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 w would you mind if I uh, asked him to, to answer that question? I'm happy to do it, but I think he would make a much better job of it. Is that, is that yeah, sure. acceptable? Yes, certainly, if uh, right. Terry would like to. Yeah, the, if you've read the right-wing papers over the last fortnight or so, the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph particularly, you know, you would think the world was ending and, you know, Christianity is being eradicated and, and poor Christians are being persecuted. But if you read what came after that, after that initial hysteria, you start to see a bit more considered opinion emerging. And I've seen quite a few interesting articles about secularism, about disestablishment, about all the issues that concern us, starting to treat the subject seriously. And, you know, I'm putting all these articles up on the website, so do keep looking at the NSS website and follow them, because I'm trying to give a balanced idea of what the media is saying. And it's not just saying that this is the end of the world. There's a lot of other stuff too which is positive in our favour. And I think there is a, an element of desperation in this hysterical uh, reaction that we're getting from some of the papers and from the usual gang of, of Dr. Carey and, and the Christian Legal Centre and Andrea Miniciello Williams. You know, we, we know what they're going to say. There's no need to say it. We could say it for them. We know precisely what they're going to say before they open their mouths. And before the, our, our court case was announced, I wrote on the NSS website exactly a prediction of what was going to happen. And so it came to pass that the, the hysteria went out of control for a few days. But the fact that the Queen had to get involved as well, she had to be rolled out to, to read a speech that the Archbishop of Canterbury had written for her about how wonderful establishment is and how misunderstood it is and you know the established church is the best thing since sliced bread and it protects us all and you know we, what, would, what a terrible consequence would, would follow if it was disestablished. Well, you know, that smacks of desperation. It seems to suggest to me that if they're having to, to roll out the big guns like that, they, they've lost the argument. And when all this has died down, <coughs> and you know, the, the people have calmed down a bit about it, I think we'll get a very sensible debate on the issue of disestablishment. Something that the NSS has been trying to provoke for decades without much success, but you know, this combination of things that all came together at once, the Dawkins survey, uh, this, this court case about the Christian hoteliers, our court case, they all came together in the same week and caused this explosion. Um, so I don't think it's all bad news at all. I think, I think this will um, provoke something that we've wanted to provoke for a long time, and I think it will, it will have good consequences in the end. It will take a long time, though. But I'll, can I just comment about disestablishment? Somebody was asking a question about it over there. But I, I think there was an interesting um, editorial in The Guardian saying that there's no government who is going to invest the amount of time, legislative time, that would be required to disestablish <coughs> the Church of England. It would take decades to do it and hundreds of pieces of legislation that have to be repealed and revised. And all of these pieces of legislation, all the changes have got to be approved by the uh, Commonwealth countries over which the Queen is also uh, monarch. 
So it would, it would take two lifetimes to actually unpick all that. And the Guardian said, well, what we're seeing actually is disestablishment from the bottom up. We have to uh, get rid of, you know, a brick at a time from the foundations until eventually it collapses. And we started that process, I think, when we got rid of the blasphemy laws. Because the blasphemy laws protected particularly the Church of England. Um, that was one of the uh, messages to them that, you know, you're not special anymore. <coughs> Getting rid of the uh, bishops in the House of Lords would be fantastic. That would be a real, uh, you know, blow to them. But the one thing that the Queen said was that in her coronation oath, she promised that she would be defender of the faith, defender of Anglicanism specifically. Prince Charles has already said that he wants to be the defender of all faiths, which, if he carries it through into his own coronation, will mean that the special relationship between Anglicanism and the monarchy will be broken. And that will be another brick out of the wall. So I think we, are, we will make progress. It will take decades, but we'll get there in the end. Um, Geraint, you had your hand up, please. Yeah. <clears throat> so, suppose in an ideal world, suddenly the religious lobby wasn't fighting and the government was doing exactly what you were suggesting. How do you go about excising the um, school, the church, well, particularly the Church of England, but all faiths generally from the public school, from schools? Yeah, that, that, that's actually a very difficult thing. Um, I just want to just do a little PS to one thing that, that Terry said to, to illustrate the, the point that he was making about how complicated it was. Is that one of our council members is very interested in these oaths that, that are said at the coronation. Uh, and, uh, and they're slightly different in Scotland than, than they're said in England. And that kind of thing is all very uh, complicated and, and <coughs> laden with history. And of course, the, the, the uh, obsession there was, of course, in the, 16th century with the, the Catholics being regarded much as I have to say sometimes Muslim extremists are, are, are regarded now and, uh, and this, this council member was, was suggesting that, uh, uh, that the oath uh, that the Queen uh, gave or that rather the next monarch gives uh, uh, should be altered in this way to be less discriminatory and, uh, to, towards Catholics and that kind of thing um, and I did a bit of research and, and, and realized, unfortunately, before we said anything, that the very act of doing that uh, would, uh, in itself, actually uh, invalidate the union uh, of England and Scotland. The very act of changing that oath was an auto the automatic consequence. It didn't need a court case. It didn't need any act of parliament. The very act of doing that automatically broke the, the, the union. And so you, that just gives you an idea of just how complicated it is, uh, which I thought you might find uh, amusing. Now, to answer, to, to answer the, the more specific question, it's actually quite difficult because uh, a lot of the, in fact, the, the churches own the property, uh, even though I suspect if you were able to go back uh, you'd find that the, the public gave the money. Well, inevitably, the public gave the money, uh, but it, not just necessarily to the church, but very often they'd have a, a whip round and gave it to the church to do it. And so you could argue, should be able to argue, but can't because it's too late now, uh, that really it's, it was really given to the church in trust <coughs> for the public, not, not, not just for the church itself. Um, but so I... Uh, we clearly couldn't stop all these schools, that they, they're, they're there, they need to be continued. Uh, I presume that we would have to actually pay the church rent uh, for the schools and perhaps compensate them in, in, in several other ways. Um, they, they seem to forget the fact that we've educated their people for all these years um, free, uh, pretty well. Um, and uh, uh, there is actually some precedent for this. Uh, uh, in Ireland of all places because it's even worse in Ireland uh, where there are whole swathes of the country where there isn't anything other than a Catholic church and uh, school, Catholic church school 
uh, and the way they treat other people of other faiths that none are, that effectively don't exist. Uh, and uh, and so th there is a move now to actually start to uh, to change that. Uh, and and of course the um, the Catholic Church owes the state quite a lot of money for back to the sort of minor question of child abuse. Uh, there's huge amounts of money that are owing. So fortunately, it doesn't actually have to cut. The, the money is already owed. Uh, and so it can be taken off the slate, as it were, and I think that's going to be, uh, to, to be, uh, ex that debt is going to be extinguished, at least in part, by the transfer, the, the, the physical transfer of the ownership of these properties to the state and for those schools to become uh, secular schools. Uh, and, and, but I think we would have to pay the church and, and uh, 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 I think it'll eventually get to the point when the church really is on its knees when that's what's going to happen and that's probably the only way it'll be able to finance itself because you can't keep a national organization going on on, on in the case of the Anglican church 89,000 people uh, age 70 uh, it just doesn't work um, so th there are some very dramatic things that are going to happen in, in the next uh, in the next few decades on all of this and I think that might be part of it Yes, thank you. Um, what keeps me cheerful, despite all this um, horrible impotence of religion into schools, is when I talk to our grandchildren, who are um, three children of undoubted intelligence and of secondary school age, and when we talk to them about the religious education they're getting, it's quite obvious that it rubs onto them not at all and and and, and their, their their healthy attitude to it is extremely encouraging so um, do you think that uh, we should have confidence in our young people uh, broadly educated as many of them still are and uh, so much more aware of the world around them uh, than uh, such children used to be do, do you think we can have confidence in them to um, take a good hard look at the religious education they're getting and say, no thank you. Uh, well, I'll only answer that question if everybody promises not to tell anyone what I've said. <laughs> 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 I, think, I, think, I think you're right to a degree, and I, I, I think one of the biggest pluses for us was when uh, religious education became kind of multi-faith and whatever. and, and any child who's got anything between their ears are going to think, well, you know, well, they can't all be right, and probably none of them are. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure that's what happens. Um, and certainly the statistics about young people's beliefs uh, show that at least two-thirds of them, and that was 10 or 15 years ago, uh, don't regard themselves as being religious. And, and, and the... Uh, as I was alluding to earlier, the young people's component in church attendance is virtually you know, nothing. And Sunday schools have, you know, used to be very important, and now there are hardly any of them, uh, except perhaps with evangelical churches. So I think that's right. And I, I, I was uh, stopped dead the other day by a statistic that, um, Terry will correct me if I've got wrong, but I think it was something like, Somebody did a survey of, of, of Church of England schools and discovered that what proportion of them were that didn't even have a daily act of worship? <coughs> Church of England schools, not community ones. Three uh, out of ten, was it? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, thirty percent of the schools of Church of England schools don't actually have a daily act of worship. And, and so, you know, I think they're losing the. Uh, uh, I think that says it all, to be frank. And I, th I think you're right. Yeah. Okay, could I ask that Dennis, is there a time by at which we're going to be kicked out? Or? Uh, we've got this room till half past ten, I believe. So. Oh, I don't want to go and buy it. Are you happy to take one or two more? No, I, 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 I'm here as long as anybody wants to. Listen. Right, okay. Yes. Yeah, a couple of questions, Steve. Uh, well, tactical questions, really. Uh, first off, I know what you're saying about concerns about different faiths producing new schools. Um, from what I've seen, I haven't done a, a measure, but it seems to me that uh, the Muslims are behind uh, the other major faith groups in what they're doing in terms of setting up free schools. Um, 
certainly I've, I've noticed Sikh, Hindu and Jewish schools setting up, and not many Muslim schools. And I think they're, they, are, they are behind. Uh, about three years ago, there was talk of maybe 90% of independent Muslim schools closing, because they were short of funds. Because they're, they're not very well organised, and they don't put their hands in their pockets to, to pay for things. So, so when you say, you know, there's this concern about fundamentalism, I'm not sure if it's disproportionate. And I'm not more worried about other faith schools, like Sikh schools or Hindu schools. I just think that maybe tactically it's wrong, because if you look at why someone like Goy is moving the way that he's moving, <coughs> I think you've mentioned it yourself in terms of the decline of the church, and the tendencies, and the other way it's being pushed is with diversity. And they know, they can see the writing on the wall, Equality means that they're going to lose power. You know, if disestablishment comes, whatever, they're, they're going to lose power. And those two things mean they're going to lose power. Now, by Go's motivation for moving so quickly as he did with the faith schools is to maintain the advantage that, that the C of E has at the moment and the Catholics have at the moment. All they've got is infrastructure and money that means they can move quickly to introduce free schools where other faiths can't. And this is an accumulator effect. So you've got their advantage already, which is huge, and this speed that they're getting, and the cash, means that they can double, triple, plus order of several magnitudes, that advantage over other fights. So to me there, there's an equality issue. And I would be saying to people of other faiths, don't join the bandwagon, you should be opposing this the same as us, because ultimately, this is about Christians getting advantage over other faiths. This isn't about <coughs> enabling them. It's, it's about Christians maintaining, extending, and entrenching that advantage. So I think in some ways, we've got more in common with those other faiths, perhaps, than we realise. I'm not, I'm not for once saying that I think we should treat secularism as another faith position. I don't want to fall into that sort of bullshit. Um, but I don't want to go there. That, that's, that's one point, just a tactical thing about whether we've got more in common with some of those other faiths than we think, uh, in, politically. But the other one is, tactically, the... You didn't mention the new uh, APPG or religious education that the BHA have signed up to. And that's, that seems like uh, it's going to have quite a big effect. And we've seen all sorts of figures about the, the last 15 years, the mushroom and take up of RE, and some schools only spend a pound a pupil a year on RE, and all this sort of huge amount of figures. And it, it seems to me that the, the obvious thing to do, obviously you're working from the top down in terms of being a lobby group, but the thing for parents to do is to vote with their feet. And same with collective worship, you've got a right of withdrawal. You've got a right of withdrawal from RE as well. And if more people actually withdrew from their children from RE and said, no, we're not having it, the pressure that puts on a school is enormous. It doesn't take more than 10 or 20% of people to withdraw from uh, collective worship. And the school could apply for determination and say, right, that's it, we're not doing collective worship. The same with RE. Withdrawal from RE, if a, if a person from another faith position does it, they're almost guaranteed an interview with their head to say, oh, what's going on, you're withdrawing from RE. If, if people who are a secular then did the same thing, then you'd reduce RE, and this whole thing about RE deserving a huge amount of money, because there's a quarter of million GCSEs going through every year, you'd reduce the budget, because all of a sudden people would be saying, well, we don't need the budget for RE, because no one wants to do it. And if people, parents, voted with their feet, then it won't it to that extent. And that's maybe something I think the NSS should be looking at and saying, would you support a withdrawal from RE campaign? No, we certainly do that, and we have done that. Um, and, and we were responsible for the change in the law in 1996, where, for the first time, uh, pupils, older pupils themselves, could uh, get withdrawn not with their parents' permission, but on their own, uh, on their own side. And we actually tried to extend that this year, and we didn't get it any further, despite support from the uh, uh, Joint Parliamentary Group on Human Rights. I do agree with that, although so there's the other problem about uh, withdrawal, which is for, particularly for younger children, and, and if they, it's not really them that want to do it, it's the parents, then it's quite hard on the child uh, if they're the only one and they're kind of sitting out in the cold, but um, well, that's that's why you need a big campaign. No, I I, I I I do agree with that, and we'd like to. We have encouraged that in the past, and, and perhaps it's time to give that that that's another kick. As to whether 
it's a uh, whether the, the, we're going to have the Muslims joining with the NSS or, or on these schools. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, the the time and time again, uh, you get uh, the Muslims bundling in with, uh, particularly with Baroness Varsi, uh, uh, with the Christians. They they think that some faith is better than no faith. Uh, and, and I was uh, had quite a, a, a flinty conversation on, as it happened, Radio Belfast this morning with a Muslim came into that and I got a kicking over uh, over council prayers and, and the, the context of it was um, uh, the uh, Merton, London Borough, uh, care worker who was an evangelical Christian and didn't want to work on Sundays and, uh, uh, and I said, well, you know, we all want our weekends off, you know, why should they get privileged and um, if it's part of the contract, fair enough, but it isn't, well, you know, you can't expect any favouritism and uh, and so the Muslim comes in and says, you know, everybody's faith should be reflected and basically, you know, that's the the, the white card, that uh, the trump card for everything and of course so we had a really, well, quite a, you, see, you, would, you might think that they, they would be on the other side, but oh no, anything that's religious goes and, um, and that they see, they actually quite, they prefer the bishops to be in the House of Lords than not be there, even though they're Anglican, because it's a faith position, and that goes before everything. Uh, so, uh, and as far as the schools are concerned, I mean, we've actually worked, we were putting, oh, we've been talking qu at quite a lot of length and quite positively with uh, Michael Goh's team, um, and, and I spoke to all the ministers, um, of uh, on on this major point about Muslim extremism, and we were actually encouraging, and they've even gone on record as saying they appreciate our support both for the uh, the, the uh, creationist side against the creationist side and on the extremist side. And by God, they're taking that seriously. We really put them on the on the spot about that, and it turns out, and I'm absolutely convinced they're telling me the truth. Uh, that they've actually got MI5, MI6, all the security stuff. They put a lot of effort into actually making sure that the, the, the few schools that go through, and I think that's why it is a few schools, are actually signed off on the terrorist side and on the extremist side. And, and I actually com I, I've congratulated Michael on that, because I mean, that's so most of the time we're saying, Wah. but uh, on that and on the creationism side, we have actually said that we think they're doing Yes, the middle. Yeah. Um, what about class? Uh, here we are. You've, you've told us that uh, participation, attendance in the Church of England is precipitously declining. But then we've got all these parents who want to get their kids into Church of England schools. And I get the impression they're predominantly middle class parents. Yeah, and so. I haven't got the hard information, but you may have. Uh, to what extent is it true that, in fact, certainly Church of England schools are being used as a way of establishing class segregation in education? Because, after all, for over 20 years now, the comprehensive system has been under attack. It's been dismantled. And uh, I think this is one strand, one way in which uh, uh, sharp social class differences between schools uh, can be uh, widened. What do you think? Oh, no, there's no doubt about it. And, and uh, the, the biggest predictor of, uh, of academic success for a child um, is the aspirations of the parents. And, and I think generally it's accepted that the middle class parents are more aspirants in that, in that way. And, and they have the more organized lives generally because they haven't got the difficulties of of, of uh, both parents having to go out to work and, and, other, and, and other issues that are associated with, with uh, having less money that uh, and, uh, the, uh, are undoubtedly pushing the proportion of uh, middle class kids up um, and, and there's, there's often here about uh, uh, the so selection happening uh, by uh, sort of where did you go on holiday and what kind of car have you got? Uh, and I don't think they're a, 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 a at all. 
uh, I think that uh, that is what happens, and and, uh, and and certainly there's some very good studies from London University um, uh, that uh, I can give you afterwards that uh, that show that the the attributes of the kids in these schools, uh, their sort of kind of social background and that kind of thing, is very much higher up the tr up the greasy pole than the population around the school and showing that there clearly is cherry picking and the cherry picking is that kind of thing although i think one of the other things that's as important i was at a big education what was a high powered education seminar of windsor council of all places about 18 months ago and as well as cherry picking i think what's almost as important and we actually in the end decided more important is the elimination of children who are difficult to teach for whatever reason whether it's behavioral or language or disability or whatever uh, and if you if that they're much more likely to put make it difficult for the teachers to to uh, potentially pull down other kids uh, uh, and they the church of course manages to avoid these people and even if you look at free school meals, you will find that whatever you read in the Bible about uh, being nice to people who don't have a lot of money and everything, and all these wonderful parables, that actually what the church schools do is soak up the people who don't have free school meals. And there's a, there's a substantial difference in the proportion with a lower proportion in, in, in the church schools. So yes is the answer to your question, and the, there's several studies that that uh, support it, and none that I know of that don't. There's still slightly more blood spot on this side, sorry. Um, I was blown away by the um, Richard Dawkins surveys of, of sort of Christians or affirmed Christians in the, um, the census. And when I read it, I think I, I was just, you know, just like, what? And I thought I knew, and, and I obviously <laughs> didn't. I was just wondering whether or not you were thinking possibly. And of course, you'd have to know the answer in some ways to do a similar survey about this very idea of, of, of faith schools. Uh, you know, this general um, area of, of the topics we're talking about this evening. And and I'm just wondering if you've thought of doing that as well, an organisation, or yeah, I, I think or the, any other organisation. Yeah, I, I think the problem is with the NSS doing surveys, so, even though we would go to a reputable organisation to do them. <coughs> That the that the uh, the press because they don't want to, we won't want to believe the answers will say well of course it was done by the NSS and can't buy imply that it was biased and I suppose there are ways that you can slightly bias <coughs> bias the answer thank goodness the government try hard enough with it when the way that they do it for the, to get the highest number of religious people in the census there's no doubt about the way that's done yeah, yeah. There, there's have been I, I've written a, there's a paper about it that I wrote on the website. Uh, and uh, it's quite irritating, I got to the end of it and spent a long time on it, just then discovered there was actually some academic support saying exactly the same thing, that it's effectively it's cultural Christians uh, that, it, that it ends up measuring, but it's done very carefully about exactly what words you use to sequence in the, in, in the census and, and, and creating a kind of climate and, and, and effectively it's saying, I'm not a Muslim is what it's really saying, I'm a cultural Christian, uh, that, that's the effect of it. Well, um, but as far as the, sorry. So I asked many of my colleagues at work at the time of the census what they put on the forms and, and you know about this, and really they it was more like an automatic thing. It was yeah. like uh, my parents are Christians or identified Christians. Christians is good, and therefore, and I'm not doing. nothing, and I have values, and I, I have yeah. moral values, yeah. all that kind of. Of and, course it is. And and then I also. Um, um, uh, recently my father died and we had a humanist um, ceremony and um, it was just a wonderful ceremony I've been to a lot of sort of uh, Christian ceremonies and various other things in, in recent years and, and from my point of view they were all abysmal and the amount of people I, that came back up to me afterwards mm. and just said that was wonderful I love that I love this little bit this little bit that you know and and I was just so blown away that I, and, and, and they were so surprised when I said well why don't you do it or, or why why wouldn't you've done it for this person or that person and again 
it was just it was like an just a, like an automatic. It, it wasn't yeah. something that was that they they'd thought about. And then when when of course when you're in grief, and then you get I think what shall I do? Then I think the, the the sort of the systems that are there just channels people into these things because we're trying to find a humanist minister, for instance, in Nottingham. We couldn't find one. We, there was this really, really good ecumenical minister, and she was very good. She did it exactly how I would want it to do. So you know, but that that was more luck than by sort of um, my ability to have influence over that. Well, answering your two points, the, um, the I'll start with the last one. I, if it, which I just comment on this: is that my father died five years ago, and. Uh, it was uh, 550 miles from London, uh, and it was 150 miles to the nearest humanist celebrant. Uh, and I decided to do it myself, and it was the most beautiful village in the northwest of Scotland, just along the side of the loch uh, where the burial ground was. And so I had this wonderful uh, blank tableau of how I was going to do it in this intensely religious Catholic village. And I had everybody uh, assembled at the graveside. They couldn't work like that. And then what on earth was going to happen next, and they could hear this noise, and then, oh, it's a piper. Ah, I can, there he is, just coming over the hill and along this little windy road along the side of the loch, another five minutes to the, to, to the graveside. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the hearse following a little way behind. And then we had the piper there, and uh, we, we, we lowered the coffin into the, uh, into, into the grave while the piper was playing, and then uh, and we were to pet poetry, and I was there with my mother and uh, everything. And it was, uh, and then the Kaylee afterwards was preceded by people talking about my father and um, for an hour, and then then a, a, a big uh, a <coughs> proper Kaylee. And the number of people who are intensely religious who came up to me in tears and said that was so wonderful, so personal, just the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's a lovely thing to do. Uh, but, but your but your previous point was about was, was as, as you remember uh, uh, about these surveys. Well, first of all, I, I think it would be unfair, but I think they wouldn't believe us. But there are often what about these Dawkins. I th I do think. <coughs> well, he's know, done it, and that's fine, and, and yeah, it was good. So um, they but... would say the same thing about Dawkins. In fact, I think in some ways um, your organisation possibly has a softer image than. Dawkins simply because of his his manner. Um, yeah. he, he's just mm. he's you know he's just more sort of much understood, uh, misunderstood. Well, but I'm saying goodbye. They love to hate him. He's a bit more strident. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 but I, I, I like that about. Well, him. well of course. Yeah. But I, I think a lot of it is there is such an unfairness about the way, it, just the language is used. It seems impossible. In fact, it almost seems like a grammatical mistake. To, to, to use the word atheist or secularist without a pejorative adjective. It is mandatory to do that. It's bad grammar to, uh, to say atheist or secularist without some horrible adjective before it. I mean, that, that, that's the way it works, isn't it? Um, and um, uh, it's, it's, so that's, that's a problem. And, 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 and about the, they just hate Richard because he tells the truth. They, don't, they find it uncomfortable. It's another symptom of the point that Terry made, that if they've got to, bre if they've got to wheel out her Britannic majesty to, to, into the argument about the established church, and are actually having to say, oh, it's inclusive, well, obviously forgetting all these oaths that she said, I, I mean, it just shows that they are so insecure, they realise that it's, that, 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 going back to those figures I was giving, it is imploding at a hell of a rate. And they're desperately trying to shore it up. And that's why they're so unpleasant to Richard. It's, it's, it's the cornered rat syndrome, I'm afraid. Mm. Um, but uh, there we are. Uh, Might that not be a reason to... to, to um, can I just no, excuse me. So sorry, there's something somebody... about funerals. Beg your pardon. Um, follow up what that gentleman's... Uh, is that all right if he does that? Or okay, it, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, but if it follows directly on, you see, and it's, it's very important... The, the British Humanist Association trains celebrants to organise, to, to um, conduct funerals, w w weddings and net namings. I think there are about 300 throughout the country now. So I, don't, I don't know how this comes in with the other 150 miles, but they, they are pretty widely Well, they're not spread. in Scotland. Not, not perhaps in Scotland. 
that there are five or six in Nottingham, uh, that there are um, 15 or so in, in the East Midlands. Um, and their, their names are on the BHA website, quite easy to find, uh, and they are circulated through um, all funeral directors. So I'm sorry if you were unable to find a humanist celebrant, but in fact they are available and easy to find through these avenues. And I'm sorry to interrupt. But, but, uh, <laughs> no, I think the apertorial is over, so what were you going to say? It's important to follow that up. I'm just going to say that because the, uh, Dawkins managed to create such a stir with his survey, and because he did it in, through Ipsos Mori, and, and you know, no one knew that it was him who had commissioned the survey whilst it was being carried out and so on, uh, and it managed to have such a big impact, it might be that another such survey, which is conducted by such a reputable institution and without prior knowledge of the participants in the survey that it was the secularist who commissioned it, would perhaps you know, in increase the stir. You know, it, it would be another um, you know, reason for them to have to wheel out the big guns again. No, no, I, I think it's a very good point. And we, we, it, it, Terry will <coughs> confirm we, we were in a council meeting with them last week where we were making much the same point, and I think it's a very good point. And, uh, We'll go back and, and uh, renew our, um, our thoughts as to what the best direction to do that in. But I think that's absolutely right. And, 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 and we didn't do the court case for this reason. But I mean, if you had to work it out in the from a publicity perspective, I mean, it was publicity that money just couldn't buy, um, and, uh, and and raising the, this new debate. And uh, it, it was it was worth it for that alone. So uh, there we are. Yeah, absolutely right. Right. Uh... That well, there's yes. a guy behind who hasn't spoken. Yes, if you love. In the green. Hi, um, it's my first time at a secular society meeting. I'm an atheist, but I'm also a liberal. And I've been listening to the conversation. Just a bit of a background. Um, I was never withdrawn from um, attending morning assemblies and morning prayers, despite the fact that my parents were Hindus. I don't intend to withdraw my daughter from assemblies because I think it's very important that she feels part of the school, but that at the same time, I would like, to her, I'd like her to be able to make a choice about what she believes when she grows up. I was allowed to make a choice. I decided to choose atheism. At the same time, as I said, I'm a liberal. And it seems to me that the tone of what I heard was that we should be arguing against religious education altogether, whereas my view is that it's quite important, actually, to allow people to have religious education, and perhaps we should be influencing the curriculum and influencing the agenda so that people are able to make informed decisions about what they wish to leave and what they wish to take away. My experience of, um, of, um, of people who I know who, have, who are of a younger generation, who are um, of a faith, or they, they're now of faiths. So they'll take a little bit of Buddhism away and say, I like the meditation. They'll take a little bit of the Christian parables away and say, I like that principle. They'll take a little bit of something else away and that's useful. And they'll take a little bit of atheism away and say that's good too. Is there an argument, and I'm, I'm just putting this as a question, is there an argument to actually influence the curriculum so that children are given the choice and are able to make an informed decision of Compulsory their own? Compulsory astrology or something like that, you know? <coughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, a more open version would be a good idea. And I, I suspect that uh, uh, the, the, there is a degree of that. There is a degree of that anyway. Um, uh, I, I'm uncomfortable about the uh, the open-mindedness and the, the the objectivity of a lot of RE that's that's there. And uh, we try desperately to influence the the framework on on which RE is taught uh, and failed totally. I mean, it really was a kind of, and it's the same in Scotland, where we also operate, that the, the, <coughs> the, the religious vested interests are working so hard um, to, to kind of push their position. And, and, and something I find really offensive, it, just one example, is how uh, religion has kind of monopolized concern for the planet. That's, that's now in RE. Why the hell isn't that isn't in science? Outrageous. 
but it's a kind of, well, we've got to say something that people will like and will make us feel popular, so let's do that. In, and somebody the other day said, there's a Christian way to boil a kettle. And you think, <laughs> and I suddenly realised, you don't put so much, you don't put too much water in it, so you're not using, only using energy that harms the planet. Oh my goodness, you've got to be a Christian and believe in transubstantiation and the virgin birth to do that, don't you? My goodness. Um, could I just say, mention a name that hasn't been mentioned? That is Stephen Tweed, the man who kicked out um, Portillo. Have you, Keith, had any much correspondence with him or talk with him? He's the Shadow Education Secretary. And of course, Labour kicked off much of this with its academies programme and pushing faith schools. Um, what's his uh, take on what is happening with faith schools and with academies and what Labour might do? Well, I think I'm not an I'm not an expert on on Labour Party policies, but my, my my gut feel is that they are a little concerned about the the demise of local education authorities. But the problem is that that that's quite difficult for them to sustain uh, on the floor of the house because they started that um, the 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 whole concept of. Uh, of academies was one that they started. It started in a very uh, seductive way by saying, well, let's just do it in these really poor, poor areas that have got a terrible problem. And, and people thought, well, I suppose it sounds a bit mean to, uh, uh, to object to these on principle where they're just being used in, 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 in such extreme circumstances. We better let it go. And of course, having conceded the principle, uh, then of course it gradually got uh, widened out. The next sort of wheeze was, oh, these are for excellent schools, centres of excellence. Um, uh, it, it, so the sort of thing's gone completely, completely on its head. Um, so um, we, uh, what's happening is that the education system is effectively being dismantled uh, in the way that it was, and I, I think that's terrible. But I don't think Labour are making much of a job. Of, of, of fighting against it, I'm afraid. I'm not making a party political point, but I'm okay. Well, I think right. we've uh, we've probably come to a natural conclusion. You've been a, oh, so a very stimulating audience, and uh, I hope uh, you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, so I, I'm going to conclude by saying that um, I probably gave up a pretty high flying job 15 years ago because I thought that secularism was very very important, and this job came up. I don't think I realised then just how important. Um, and the, the, the National Secular Society is now many multiples of the size that it was when I took over then. Uh, but the, and it's been a very exciting job. I think it's the best job in the world, uh, and, and I'm very lucky to have it. Uh, but it is a, it, what you do learn is how important secularism is. And I think that it, I put it behind global warming and global terrorism as the next one on the list to actually underpin Western democracy as we know it. Because without that, you actually ain't going to get it the way that uh, religious extremism is on the rise. And I see a lot of that in the work I do at the United Nations. So please support secularism. We don't have the kind of hierarchical organization that the churches have or the money that the churches have, which means that it's really down to people like you to support us and to support it in, in Leicester and everywhere you can. Um, and and in, in the wider common good. And, and you're the people who understand that. And, and please, please try everything you can do, both with your time and with your pocketbooks, to actually support it because it really, really is important. And, and I suppose I have to end up with a, with a commercial. There are some booklets at the back there. I mean, being a member of, uh, thank you, being a member of, of, of Leicester Secular Society or any of the other uh, kindred bodies is, is fine, but the kind of work that I've been doing, and I do it in Brussels and Geneva and uh, as well as in, in Strasbourg, as, as well as in London uh, and indeed in Edinburgh um, does actually cost quite a lot of money, um, but we do are regarded as as uh, uh, fighting very much above our weight and giving very good uh, bangs for our buck. So I do ask you to to join nationally 
uh, and to support us and just also get the news line every week which you'll find fascinating uh, and to support the, the work we do. Thank you very much indeed. Bye.